What's up, guys? So, thank you. Thank you guys so much. I, uh, man, Aziz, uh, I, gotta, I gotta say, I have, uh, you know, we've been speaking together for a couple of weeks now, but this is the first time that we've seen Aziz stand on a pul- in front of a pulpit and, and share a message. And um, years ago, I started having these visions and dreams of a, before Aziz came to Christ, just his mission, uh, visions and dreams of him standing in front of thousands of men and sharing his testimony uh, of being, uh, 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 sparing the gospel. And so I leaned over to David, and I'm like, this is, this is prophetic for me. Like, this is fulfilled, like, vision that I've had of you. And I, I believe Aziz, uh, one, God is, God's best is, is yet to come for you. You did some amazing things in Afghanistan with, with us, and uh, we've done so many like we said earlier, hundreds of missions together, but there's thousands of missions more that God has something even greater in store for you. And I'm, I'm so proud of you. I love you so much. And, and I believe that God's going to use you in such a powerful way. If you look, there's no one right now in the world that's speaking out uh, for these women uh, and children that are left in Afghanistan. There's not a voice for them. And uh, in Aziz, you've been perfectly positioned by God himself to be that voice. And, uh, and I'm super proud of you for having the courage to do it. <laughs> so. And uh, the Pastor Ron, thank you for allowing us to come, man, allowing us to be here this weekend. Uh, this church is family to me, your family to me. I love being here. Uh, and uh, I love doing men's events. Uh, when I pull in a parking lot and see four wheel drive trucks and Harley Davidsons and work trucks, it, it's, so, it's so awesome. I'm like, man, this is so cool that men would give up their Sunday night to come here and do this. But I do, I do have to say, this, there was one Prius out there. Uh, I don't know. I, I don't know whose who's wife let them borrow that. Don't, don't raise your hand. <laughs> so, uh, the great thing about men's events is uh, you, you always, uh, I always get to start off with a joke. So I want to tell you guys a joke. Uh, so, you know, here in, in Oklahoma, I know you guys got the big mega bass pro shops, right? Where you got like the, the boats and sell trucks and all kind of stuff. So there's a bass pro shop and this guy goes his first day as the salesman and he shows up from the job and he meets the manager and the manager tells him, okay, this is what you're going to do. You're going to stay in this section and you're going to greet customers, find out what they want, take them to it. And then you try to upsell them, right? If they buy something, you try to upsell them to buy, them, buy something else. So the guy's like, I got it, right? First day on the job, he's there. The manager leaves him, and all day he's there. Uh, he's, the manager's going. He comes back, and he says, okay, how was your first day? Uh, how much did you sell? He said, well, I sold $163,132.53. He's like, what? How did you sell that much on, on your first day? He said, well, I was selling a, a fishing hook. And I upselled them to a, a, f- a set of fishing poles. And then I asked the guy, do you have any, any, a boat to go out? And he said, no. So I took him over to the boating section. I, t- I took him, put him on a, a 25-foot skeeter boat. And we got it hooked up. And we went to hook it up to his truck. But his truck didn't have enough to pull. So I took him to automotive. And we traded his truck in and upgraded his truck. And out, he got an F-250. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, it totaled $163,000. And the guy's like, the manager's like, hold on. This guy came in for a fishing hook. And you sold him $163,000 worth of stuff? He said, no, no. He came in for tampons. And I said, man, your weekend's over. You need to go fishing. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> you can get anything at Bass Pro Shop. So, so uh, Aziz, you know, gave, gave a really good lead in, and we didn't even talk about this before, uh, to talking about fear and, and, and being scared because, uh, you know, this world's a, we're in the battlefields of Afghanistan or, or right here in, in, in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, that you're going to face fear. And the Bible has so many incredible lessons on fear, and I want to start in the Word of God at, at Joshua 1.9, where God tells us, have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go, right? That's essentially what, what Aziz was saying. And, and uh, you know, as I, was, as I was preparing this message, uh, this, this is kind of a new message for me. Uh, I've given it once before, but it's a pretty new message. I was preparing this message, and I really felt God leading me to work on a message uh, kind of unique to me to speak on fear. 
and, uh, and overcoming fear. And I was talking to my pastor, uh, Pastor Jeff Wells, on, on the phone, and my wife overheard me talking. And when I got off the phone, I could tell she wanted to say something. I could always tell when she's, she's just waiting for me to stop so she could tell me something. And she's like, I don't think you should give that message. Uh, on fear. I don't think it's fair for you to get a message on fear. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I asked her to clarify. And she said that if I challenged people on being afraid, that people wouldn't relate to me because in her words, I'm not afraid of anything. And uh, so I have to tell you, and be honest, that boosted my ego a little bit, stroked my ego. Like, I mean, from a wife to say, it made me a little bit proud from a wife to say that she believes that about me, that I'm not scared of anything. But uh, I have to be honest with, with both her and all of you guys, uh, that couldn't be further, further from the truth. Uh, the truth is, in fact, that the reason I feel compelled to speak on fear is because fear is something that, that I had a, I've had a lifelong struggle with. Uh, and I continue to learn so many spiritual lessons on fear, faith and, and, and uh, courage and ultimately obedience in the face of fear. Because that's what, you know, I mean, we can still do things that, are, that seem bold and courageous, but it doesn't mean that we're not scared. Right? It just means we have to do them anyway. Especially in the last two years, you guys, for those who heard, you know, the, the evacuations that we did in Afghanistan, uh, the river operation, I mean, how, 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 like, man, there was times that I'm like, we're not coming back. Like, this is like a kamikaze deal. Like, and, and there were times that it was, it, it was pretty scary. And the people were telling us, like, there were people on social media, like, you guys are going to get killed. There were actually people on social media telling us, I hope you guys die out there so you learn a lesson for going into this situation that you guys are in over your head with. We knew, we've been around a long time. Like, I've been around, I'd spent 14 years in special operations community. I knew what we were getting into. Uh, it, and it was, in fact, very scary. The operations in Ukraine, man, we were, I mean, I don't care who you are. Like, we were in Ukraine. I had IDF, me, me and Sea Spray, just the two of us, just two months ago, were in uh, uh, Izum, Ukraine. We went in, they had, the Russians had it occupied for, for six months, and we went in with the unit, just two of us, as they retook that, that area, and as we passed through the Izum in the, in the Russian uh, line of defense, the Russians closed in behind us. So we were with the Ukrainian unit, like literally, as we're moving, I counted in a video, I showed it to Pastor Ron, like 60 dead or dying Russian soldiers, tanks blown up, smoldering. We had Russian MiGs fly over us, uh, dropping ordnance. I never had military air over me in all my time in combat, because usually we had the air. And, uh, and, and I got a message, uh, uh, not to dime Pastor Ron out, but my board of directors, Steve Toth and Pastor Ron, are telling me, hey, you need to come home. <laughs> like, can we talk into coming home? And I'm like, I can't. <laughs> you know, God's put me out here. And, and uh, I'm like, I'm not going to do anything stupid, but I have to be here right now. And uh, in fairness to Pastor Ron, he said he knew, it was, he knew my answer before he called. <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, all that, <laughs> it, it was scary. I mean, IDF, indirect fire, was hitting with 100 yards from us. I never, in all my time in Afghanistan, seen that level of kinetic combat, like dirt, fly, like dirt flying on you in the movies. Uh, we, I ran to get cover behind this wall, and, and when the, the next uh, impact hit, the windows blew out of, blew out of that, that building. Uh, I mean, there's been some scary times. And uh, I want to take you back to this one operation that I did in Afghanistan. Um, I was in an area called, called the FADA the federally administered tribal area. And uh, what the fight is, it's a gray area between the border of Afghanistan and Pakistan because the tribal people, they don't know what Afghanistan or Pakistan is. They don't know about a border or care. All they know is they lived there for thousands of years, their family has, and, and they just, you know, they care about their, their goats and their crops and their wives and kids. That's all they care about. Like borders don't mean anything to them. And so in fairness, there's a, there's a gray area that's called the federally administered tribal area. And Conventional military forces were not allowed during the Afghanistan war to go in there and go after the Taliban because of this gray area kind of bordering Pakistan. And so the Taliban used this to their advantage to attack U.S. forces and then retreat to the Fatah so that U.S. conventional forces couldn't go in there to go after them. But the special operations community was allowed to do certain missions in the Fatah to go capture or kill and precisely target bad guys. And me being on a task force I was on, I uh, had a lot of missions in the FADA. Aziz came in, in the FADA with me plenty of times to do, uh, you know, uh, non-permissive environment missions. In this one particular operation I was on, I was with a guy named Andy, uh, who was a 25-year Navy SEAL, most of his time at SEAL Team 6, uh, CIA operative, really experienced guy, uh, different name. Uh, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, I'm just saying Andy. Uh, but, uh, and, then, uh, and then I had another guy with me, uh, 
that was uh, Aziz, similar to the same job as Aziz, but his name was Shahar. And, uh, and he, so Aziz wasn't on this operation. By the way, Aziz is way better, but, uh, but Shahar is pretty cool too. <laughs> and uh, so, so I'm on this operation, and we go into this area, and we're going to do a feasibility study for future operations to get a pretty high-level guy. And we're driving in this area uh, called the Ferry Meadows. If you, ever, if you want to see the most beautiful, one of the most beautiful areas on the planet, look it up later. It's Ferry Meadows. We're driving to a mountain called Nanga Parbat, which many people have heard of K2. K2 is the highest uh, mountain in Pakistan to climb. It's like one of the most desirable mountains to climb. But the one that's even more dangerous is the second highest mountain in Pakistan called Nanga Parbat. It means killer mountain. And it's like the mountain. If you're a mountain climber, that's like the number one mountain to climb in the, in the world. So we were actually going to Nanga Parbat on this road. It's called Ferry Meadows Road. And the road literally is like stapled to the side of a mountain. And it's narrower narrower than the, the wheelbase of a Jeep. I mean, it's really narrow, just rock stapled to the side of a mountain. And literally like sometimes at some points, like a couple of thousand foot cliff on the side. And we're driving on this road. And this old Jeep that I know probably hadn't the brake, had the brakes checked in like, 30 years or something like that, by a 15-year-old kid from the village, like, driving this thing. And I'm, like, super scared. I'm, like, on the edge of this thing. It's, like, open top, and I'm, I'm watching out the side. You can see just, like, as far as you can see down. And the kid's, like, giving us a tour. He's, like, showing me stuff, not looking. And I'm, like, I don't care. Like, I, I remember the words to this day, Anke Beyonce, which means eyes on the road. Uh, that's, like, a, the thing that goes in the limbic system from dramatic experience. Those words always be in my, in my mind, like, Anke Beyonce, eyes on the road. I'm telling him, I'm, like, stop. I don't want the tour right now, man. And uh, so he's driving us through there. And after we get through this, like, nail-biting drive, we make it in this beautiful meadow, fairy meadows. Again, one of the most beautiful places. I mean, 14,000 feet at the base, these lush green fields, rolling hills, a river going like through it. It's surrounded by 25,000 foot mountain peaks, just snow cap. It's absolutely amazing. And we, we stopped just to take it in. And uh, we're, we're like parked on the side of the road and uh, we get out of the Jeep. And it's myself, uh, Andy and Shahar and the driver. And uh, Andy, in addition to being you know, a lifelong special operations guy, he's also like an outdoor enthusiast. So he had this really big camera uh, not just for operations, like he loved taking these pictures. So he starts snapping pictures and he makes this huge cultural error. There's these little kids playing in the river and he takes some pictures of them, which is like a huge no-no. I mean, this is, this is pretty much all Taliban area. And he takes these pictures of these little kids. And right when he took it, uh, all of a sudden I hear this screaming of this lady. And it wasn't like she was in trouble, it was like rage. And this old lady is like running towards us, just screaming, and she got like fire in her eyes. And she stops in the river and picks up these two river rocks, and she throws one, picks up another one, and starts running towards us. And she was gaining a lot of ground for old lady. She's like 80 years old. She's like moving. And uh, I'm like, oh, my gosh, she's coming for us. And these two guys at Private Taliban were, were trying to stop her, but they were, the whole time they were like laughing. They were cracking up at us because they knew, they knew what was going on. And I'm like, oh, man, and she's coming towards us, and Shahar's like, don't like, don't touch her. Don't just stay away from her because if you touch her, like it's gonna be a lot of problems. And so she's running after us. And so as she gets closer, she launches one of these rocks and it's like coming straight for us. And she had like a heck of an arm and, and, uh, and we like start running in circles around the Jeep, like Keystone cops. And like, literally like, like, we're like, like literally like fend for ourselves. Like I'm pushing uh, Andy behind me. We're like fighting to get away from this lady. And we're going in circles around this open top Jeep. Like, and then we finally like she, the guys, the, t the Taliban guys got her to stop. And, uh, and she's like looking at us like still raging. And she did a few like a uh, little faints like, like these. <laughs> and we're like, <laughs> so, so she, she uh, I mean, these three, these three like spe two special operations guys and you know, Shahar is like this mountain man, like three tough dudes, just scared to death of this old lady. And when we, <laughs> that night when I finally laid down on the ground to get some sleep and it's beautiful out, you can see like literally like see space, the stars looking up. It was so beautiful. I'm late at night and I wasn't worried about the Taliban coming to get me. I was worried about that crazy old tribal lady with, a, <laughs> with fire and eyes and, and, a, and a, heck of an, a heck of an arm. And I, I even woke up dreaming about her finding us. <laughs> so <laughs> the truth is, there have actually been, in contrast to my wife, my wife would believe, the truth is, there's been many times in my life that I was not only scared, but terrified to do things that, that needed to be done. Uh, but isn't that all of us in Psalm for more another, right? At some point in our lives, whether in a war zone or in, in the challenges of everyday life, no matter who you are, uh, or how tough you are, or how smart you are, uh, how much training you have to do something, you will face fear. 
In this world, you're going to face fear. The question isn't if you're going to face fear, but when you do, how will you respond to it? Right? How are you going to respond to that fear? Will you, will you steady your trembling knees and move forward? Or will you allow fear to win? Will you allow fear to paralyze you and keep you from your goals, uh, from your dreams, from your maximum potential, uh, and ultimately keep you from the things that God created you to do? Right? What will you do in response to that fear? Author Shea Richardson said this, courage is not living without fear. Courage is being scared to death and doing the right thing anyway. Or, or the great, that is a great quote, but the, and the, and the great theologian uh, John Wayne said it like this. He said, uh, courage, courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyway. Right? That's, that's, that's what uh, courage is about. Right? It doesn't mean we're not scared. It means that we, in, in spite of our fear, we do it anyway, especially when it's the right thing to do. Now, there are, there are a variety of things uh, that we could have uh, fear about and uh, that we face every day. Uh, physical harm. Most of us are, are scared of being physically hurt. Uh, I know I am. I don't want to be hurt uh, physically. I don't like pain like anyone else. Uh, most of us are scared of physical harm. Most of us are scared of death. We all like, could feel our mortality. Uh, you can't get out of this world alive. Right? We all know we're going to die. And most of us, when we think about it, we're like, you know, most people fear death, even if not of ourselves, of our children, uh, of our people we love and care about. Uh, if you've ever been a parent around the age of 16 years old, when they get that driver's license, uh, you, don't, you don't sit so easy for a few years. You're worried about, uh, about the death of your loved ones. Even if you are a believer, even if you believe in eternity, that fear is just right there below the surface. We fear uh, illness and suffering. Uh, even Christians, believers and non-believers, we fear eternity, the unknown of eternity. Uh, these are things that we struggle with, and, and if we're honest, we could be fearful of. We fear our security, financial security as, as men. Uh, and I know all these, all you as men here, we feel a, a, a fear of like, what if I lose my job? <clears throat> Can I provide for my family, my wife, my kids, uh, the, the economy when it's struggling? We, we could be fearful of, of those things. Uh, we could be fearful professionally. We all want to achieve and, and make it to certain places in our life. And what if we can't make it? What if we can't measure up? You know, uh, underneath, the, underneath the surface of every successful man is a very insecure uh, person inside under the surface. We all, uh, if we all like kind of pull back the curtains of our heart, we're all a little insecure and dealing with the fear of these things. Most people fear relationally, like boyfriend, girlfriend, spouse. What if I end up alone? Uh, we, we fear being alone, especially as we get older. Um, we don't want to be alone in our latter years. Uh, we feel the fear of the loss of freedom. This is one I really, really have to be careful with because I love freedom so much. I've had friends die for the cause of freedom. I've seen people like Aziz, like, uh, you know, want fight for freedom. And, and here in America, this country, I feel like our freedom is under attack. I feel like the, the ability to stand right here on this pulpit in this church is under attack. And pe there's people that want to take it away. I fear... The, losing our, our freedom of speech, losing our right to bear arms. Those are things that I really fear, and I have to be very careful that I don't let that fear overcome me. And I know, I know we need to do everything that we can to stand up to those things, but there's also a, a point in a, in a place to where we have to be able to relinquish it to the one that's ultimately in charge, and, and that's God. And uh, so I have to be really careful with that one. Uh, I really fear and struggle with rejection. You know, my, I came from a rough childhood. had a lot of rejection in my childhood and, and my uh, for my, my parents, and so I really struggle with, in all my relationships, my, my, with my wife, with my children, with my friends, I, I, I fear and struggle with rejection from friends, loved ones, loneliness, being judged, um, fe the fear of failure from us feeling inadequate amongst our peers, amongst people that we respect. Uh, I'm giving a long list here, but I, I, I believe that most of us could probably relate to some of these things in this list. The fear of not being able to meet a goal or standard. Uh, letting God down, letting others down. Um, the fear of being inconvenienced. You know, the Broken Arrow is a pretty affluent community. It's a nice place. Uh, I live in the Woodlands, Texas. Um, it's like the number three most desired community to live in. And, uh, and uh, most of my friends are pretty well off and don't struggle for much. And we fear sometimes stepping out of our comfort zone because we're so comfortable in our perfect little utopias. And we don't really want to step out. Sometimes I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of bougie and 
love my little Woodlands neighborhood, and, and, uh, and then, you know, I'm laying on my recliner, and I got my pool in my backyard, I go to my hot tub at night, and, and just relax, and then next thing you know, I'm in Ukraine spending uh, 10 days in a passenger seat of a car <laughs> with a guns and bullets in my ribs, and, and uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it's nice to be able to step out of the environment a little bit and, and get back in the real world, uh, but we fear, we fear giving up things that we enjoy. Uh, we don't like to give up things we enjoy. We fear the uncertainty of the future. Um, and I think oftentimes we in America uh, lean in this guarantees of playing it safe. We want to play it safe, and we're not really in a risk. And the Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach in any part. I've, I've read this book, and you look at the people that came before us. These people that, that God challenged to take risks and do difficult things and uncomfortable things and things that were not popular. And they would never came, not one story in this, in this Bible, not one story where the people that God called to do things, did God say, I'm going to make sure you're safe. I'm going to make sure that the, the victory that you want, you're going to have that victory. No, there was never any guarantees. Eleven of the twelve apostles died doing exactly what God called them to do. The assurances are not there. It's the obedience that needs to be there from us, right? And, uh, and the, Bi- the Bible talks about fear very often. In fact, I, uh, the last time I spoke here, I spoke of this. The Bible, in fact, says, do not fear 365 times. That's one for every day of the year. Uh, I think God's trying to make a point here, right? Do not fear. Uh, he says it in uh, Isaiah, Isaiah 41.10. It says, fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold up, hold you up with my right, righteous right hand. Isaiah forty one ten. It goes on. Uh, Psalm twenty three four. Psalm twenty seven one. Psalm one eighteen six. John fourteen twenty seven. Uh, Deuteronomy thirty one seven. It goes on and on and on. Uh, Three hundred and sixty five times. I can read them all, but I won't. But I'll say this because uh, I'm pretty. I'm a pretty hard headed person. And sometimes I'm slow to pick up on things. But even I could uh, take a hint and figure this one out. What, God, what is God trying to say here? Do not fear, right? Pretty simple, right? Do not fear. Fear not. That's what God's trying to say, one for every day of the year. Look, God did not give us a spirit of fear. God is not the author of fear. God is love, and perfect love, the Bible says, perfect love casts out fear. So if God didn't give us a spirit of fear, and fear does not come from him, and we, but we, yet we face it every day. Then the question bears, where, where does fear come from? Where does it come from? Uh, fear comes from Satan. Fear comes from Satan. Now, now there's exceptions. Uh, I don't want to say the exceptions, but there's a healthy fear of God. Like we should respect and fear God. I think that's more respect. Uh, and then there's, the, there's some things that people call fear, which is really common sense, right? Uh, you know, say, I'm scared to step on the highway in traffic. That's not really... That's not really fear. That's common sense, right? Uh, I'm scared to walk out of an airplane without a parachute. No, that's common sense. That's not fear. I believe all fear that comes in our head, and there's this voice that comes in our head that tells us to not to do the things that we were created to do, that's the fear I'm talking about. There's two voices that are coming to your head. One is the voice of truth, where God's going to speak to you and burden your heart to do the incredible and bold and courageous things that he created you to do. And there's another voice. A voice of lies, a voice of the enemy that's going to tell you you're not good enough. You're not adequate enough. Because of your past, you can't do it. Because of what people think about you, you can't do that. That is the fear that the enemy puts into you. And that is a demonic spirit. I want to make, it, make this point very clear. Fear, that fear is a demonic spirit. That's not an emotion. It's not a feeling. And, and, uh, and uh, I think it's important to pause here and realize that when you feel and hear that voice, and you feel that fear, you have to know that's not your emotions, that's not your feelings, it is a demonic spirit. Whether you believe in that stuff or not, that stuff is real, and that's the enemy whisper in your ear. That, uh, and why, why does the enemy do that, right? Because fear, I believe that fear is Satan's primary weapon to keep you from being who God created you to be and doing what God created you to do. Satan wants you on the bench during a ball game. He wants you sitting in a dugout because he knows if you listen to God and you step up to that plate and you get ready to bat, and when you swing, you're going to knock it out of the park. He wants you to stay on that bench, and he wants you to sit out of that game and stay there because he knows what you're capable of. And he will speak fear into you to keep you out of the game. Men, 
You have to be able to ignore that voice and that fear. And beyond that fear, do what Aziz said. You step up and do it. Do what you have to do anyway, especially if you feel like it's something God's calling you to do. Yeah. I, have, I have a few extreme hobbies, uh, people would say. <laughs> um, one is Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Uh, I've done Jiu-Jitsu since I was five years old. Uh, I love it. I'm 42 years on the mat now. I'm not going to stop now. And uh, something about going to the Jiu-Jitsu gym where we train to, you know, break each other's arms and, and feet and legs and, uh, and try to choke each other unconscious, I love it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. I, I, I love it. It's a great place for ministry because, like, when, uh, I mean, when you're on someone's back and uh, you're literally, like, choking the hell out of them, it's, a, it's kind of, that's my dad joke, right? Choke. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great time to witness, witness, to Jesus, witness Jesus people, right? You're like, hey, you're about to die. Like, I want to introduce you to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I love jujitsu. Uh, there's a couple other hobbies I do. I, I love scuba diving. Uh, scuba diving is a big hobby of mine. And, and skydiving. I think there's a video, yep, picture of me skydiving here. Uh, I love skydiving. Uh, where's, where's Daniel at? Daniel's on my team, my media team. My friend, yep, Daniel's over here. He's on my media team. He has 11,000 jumps. Uh, it's incredible. He films most of the world records. So, so uh, I love skydiving. Uh, in fact, I... Uh, I started skydiving in the Marine Corps. I went in 1999. I went to military freefall parachute school, and, uh, and, and I became a military freefall jumper, a halo jumper, high altitude, low opening. Uh, we do these, uh, I was the, the freefall team leader at Third Force Recon Company, and we would do like uh, crazy jumps from like 30, 32,000 feet was my highest jump. Oxygen, big, uh, big insulated suits because it's cold up there. Uh, it's very sub zero up there, and uh, you know, got oxygen on your face, weapons giant uh, backpacks or equipment. We even had sometimes uh, our teams would do barrels, which are like 500-pound barrels, jumping motorcycles and Zodiac boats and stuff uh, in free fall. So I love doing jumps. And I got like 450 jumps, which is a lot of jumps from military. Did about 450 military free fall jumps. And then I had stopped because uh, you know, I went off active duty. So I stopped jumping. But then last year, my son Hunter said, man, I want to start skydiving. And I thought, man, if you're going to start skydiving, I want to do it with you because it can be really safe if you do it right and, and smartly, uh, but it can be really dangerous if you don't. So I wanted to jump with him. And so in the last few months, uh, I was like, I'll just get back into it slowly. In the last few months, I racked up another 100 jumps because uh, <laughs> I, I kind of go overboard on things. Uh, but uh, but I, I just really love, love jumping. And, uh, and, and recently, I had passed my 500th jump, which is a milestone in skydiving because if you, when you reach your 500 jump, that's, the, that's the, uh, the number of jumps you need to get your highest rated license, which is your D license, when you can start instructing and coaching. So when I got to my 500 jump, there's this milestone. You're always supposed to do something very celebratory uh, like this, for this milestone 500 jump. And so a lot of people, skydivers are kind of weirdos and crazy. So a lot of people do all kind of crazy things. Uh, one of the things that's most popular is they, people jump naked. And, uh, <laughs> but because of my ministry, I thought that wouldn't be a good idea. And so... Uh, and so I, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> I didn't do it. Uh, and there's a lot of other things people do, like the gorilla suit thing. And I, everybody does that. So I want to do something different. So I said, I'm going to eat a hamburger on my way down in free fall. So that, that was, uh, so I think I got a picture of me eating a hamburger in free fall. <laughs> I got a few bites out of it. And uh, so if you notice the wrappers in and out, is there a Whataburger here? Is this the Whataburger country? So I know, like, Everybody thinks in and out's bad because it's California and it's like Whataburger country. But you got to hear me out. Like, first of all, Whataburger, it's like nasty and greasy. <laughs> it's always cold. <laughs> and, and in and out's like super fresh. And, and, uh, and, and uh, yeah, so I like in and out. Uh, so, and full disclosure, uh, Pastor Ron serves with uh, Sean, Sean Ellickson and Lindsey Snyder, or uh, the owners of in and out. They're amazing Christian people, and they own our board at Mighty Oaks. So I'm team in and out. So <laughs> you guys can eat those nasty water burgers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, what I discovered through skydiving and, uh, is that when we, when we face fear, it, 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 anytime we face fear doing a hobby or whatever, it, it brings us closer to God. And uh, this is Scott Adams an example, but anytime we face fear, uh, you know, if we if we like, man, our, our, we get all of a sudden, my wife gets diagnosed with cancer, right away. Where are you going to turn? Especially as a Christian, it's going to bring you closer to God. Uh, anytime you you face fear, it should bring you closer to God, especially as a believer. And, uh, and I think Scott Adams is a good example because when we're in that plane ride up, you know, you got all these people that like uh, that are skydivers, and you know, probably a large portion of them 
or probably Christians, but probably more so than not, a lot of them aren't Christians. And when you're flying up, you always see that kind of quiet moment that each person takes. And I think they're doing that, that little quiet reflection and prayer, prayer towards God. Uh, they're probably doing like, uh, you know, getting that plane right, especially the tandem jumpers that never jumped before. They're getting a tandem jump. They're like, and they're doing like, like, like uh, 20 Our Fathers and 15 Hail Marys. They're like, all of a sudden, they turn, they turn Catholic. They're doing like Psalm 23 like 10 times. If they had a rosary, set of rosary beads, they'd be burning through it, right? That's, that's kind of what you see in, in that plane going up. And I think those moments that we face fear is, is opportunity to build our faith. Um, as the MMA fighter, man, every time I'd walk out to that cage, and I remember that announcer would call my name, and I'm making that walk out of the locker room to that cage, and I step in that cage, and they, they close that door, and the only thing left in that, in that cage is myself, a referee, and an opponent, a professional fighter that's trained three months to beat me. Man, those, those moments will, will make you lean on God. Uh, every time I've ever been on an on a operation, uh, and we're going out to a, a, a target to hit a target and, and uh, capture or kill a bad guy. Like, man, you're about to go into that house and breach that door and go into that room and get in a gunfight. Like, people are about to die. And it could be me. This could be my last moments uh, on earth. Like, those moments will bring you closer to God. When you jump out of an airplane and skydive, man, I love getting on the edge of that plane. Actually, I like, I like riding next to the door. The door's open. I don't like, if we're at the hotel in the Renaissance right now, I'm on the sixth floor. I don't even like looking over that rail. But, uh, but something about having that parachute on my back, I like to sit down next to that, that rail and you, outside the plane, and then you get ready to go. You stand on the edge of that door. Uh, sometimes I hang on the outside of the plane, and you get the, the ready, set, go, and you jump out of that plane. Uh, at 14,000 feet, immediately you're at 120 miles an hour, 150 miles an hour. You're going at, at, at terminal velocity or free fall. And when you pull your parachute, I pull at 4,000 feet. Literally, you're like, think about it. You're at eight to 10 seconds before impacting the earth and dying. That's the, that's the margin uh, that you're pulling your parachute. And those moments, those moments will bring you close to God. And, and, uh, and I think, I'm not saying, I'm not saying go do anything extreme. I'm not saying get in your motorcycle and fly home at 120 miles an hour. What I'm saying is that whether doing stuff like that or fear in everyday life, fear gives you the opportunity to build your faith. And why is that important? Because faith is the opposite of fear. Faith is the opposite of fear. Faith is co the complete and absolute trust in the living God. It's a relinquishment. It's saying that I can't carry this fear. I don't want to carry this fear. I wasn't created to carry this fear. And I'm going to give it to God. Because he can carry it and he wants, us, he wants to carry it for us. And it's the right thing to do in a relationship with God because he doesn't want us to have the burden. It's not ours to carry Fear actually manifests itself. Fear actually manifests itself and thrives in the absence of faith. If you don't have faith in God, if you don't have, I don't know how people can even live in this country right now with everything that's going on. With, with the absence of faith, fear manifests and it takes root and it will corrode your soul and destroy you. Fear manifests and thrives in the absence of faith. We have to have faith. And as an old special operations dude and a retired professional fighter, I, I consider myself a strategist and so when it comes to faith, I, I, I look at, I'm, I'm this way to everyone, everything, everything I look at in my life, I try to have a strategy for. It's just kind of how my mind works. And, and I look back at every time I've ever faced an opponent, whether in a battlefield of combat or in an MMA ring, I, I took time to study my opponent. When I went to Afghanistan the first time, I wanted to study Afghanistan. Afghanistan says it's called the graveyard of empires. There's been nothing but wars in Afghanistan. I read, store, I read battles from Alexander the Great, to the Russians, like I read all about the b battles in Afghanistan, why people won and why people lost and how the Afghanistan always pushed people out. I learned about who the Taliban was. I learned the history of them. I want to know their culture and their ideology. I want to know what they believed. It's very important to know your enemy. When I went to Pakistan, I spent four months learning who the Pakistan ISI was, their intelligence agency, and, and how their relationship in, in, intertwined with the Taliban and who I was facing. It's very important to know your enemy. Every MMA fight, Three months, I'd have to study. My coaches, we'd study tape on my opponent. Why? I want to know their strengths and I want to know their weaknesses. I want to know what they're good at. Because if I know what they're good at, then I can have a counterattack to win. And I like, I like winning, right? And uh, that's just me. I like winning. I don't know about you guys, uh, but I want to win, especially in a spiritual battle. Uh, and, and faith, that faith I was talking about, faith is the counterattack. It's the counter strategy to Satan's weapon of fear, right? And faith comes through. The only way we get faith, it comes through the knowledge of God's word. This is, this is where, this is our gas to fill up our tank with, uh, with faith. 
Uh, so we have to read it. We have to study it. There's no shortcuts. We have to memorize it. We have to sow it in our hearts and our minds so that you're in your, it, that way it's in your soul. And by the way, when an enemy comes, and he will come, that you're going to be equipped for battle with the full armor of God. Yeah. So where, where do you find this? One, you can pick up this book and read it. Two, every Sunday, I think Pastor Ron meets you right here and shares, shares the word with you. He teaches you. This church is full of Bible studies and small groups and places to connect and, and get fed God's word. I have on my phone, uh, I, on my phone, I keep this with me and because uh, it's always with me. It's like my, my wife calls it my pacemaker because if I'm without it for five minutes, I'll, I'll die. I can leave my car keys. I can leave my wallet. But if I lose this thing, I'm, I'm in trouble, right? Uh, but because I have this with me all the time, I keep in my little notepad and I, have, I put it up there. Uh, I keep in my notepad a thing that says victory over, over fear. And uh, in it, I have like, I have like, 30 or, or 40 verses that I keep, and I'll continue to update it. I've had it for years now in there, and I'm always updating with new verses related to specifically to fear. So again, when my wife said that I can't speak on fear, I'm the one that has 30 to 40 verses that I'm always updating on fear on my phone because I struggle with fear, and, and I keep it on my phone. And when I face fear, when I deal with anxiety, when I deal with depression, when I get anxious and I feel those symptoms of panic attacks coming on again, I used to go to my little little silver thing that I keep everywhere, my, my, I went in my car, my backpack, everything, and had Ativan in it, take that pill to calm me down, and, uh, and it would work for a moment, but it would only feed it and make it worse, because I had a crutch that I was depending on. I didn't have a solution, I had a crutch, the medicine was a crutch, it wasn't a solution. And I stopped doing that, and now what I do when I face those things is I, is I, I read God's word on that note. I read God's word, and you know what it does? It calms me, it, it brings me back to truth, and, and that truth gives me the exact peace I need. That pill is temporary. It didn't solve anything. Um, and Pastor Ron, I'll give you these because I see people taking pictures of those. I'll give you the ones that's on my phone and you guys can blast it out um, to the men. Um, <laughs> Jesus himself used this method. Jesus used the word of God. When Satan attacked Jesus in the wilderness, Jesus, Jesus countered Satan by saying these words. He said, it is written, and he quoted scripture. This is, if Jesus, if it worked for Jesus, right, I think it's good for us. Uh, I have, I have four, four truths of God's word that I want to share with you guys. Number one, God has given us a spirit of power. In 2, Corinthians, 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. We have power over Satan. Right, We have power over Satan because it's God's word. We have power over fear. We have power over temptation. We have power over every evil thing that comes at us on a daily basis. Why would we be scared of it? Right. We have power over it. Number two, God has given us a spirit of love. First John, First John 4, 18 says, perfect love casts out all fear. Fear actually brings with it a thought of punishment for our mistakes. Right, We can inappropriately fear God. I believe we have to have a healthy respect for God. I think there is a healthy fear of God. But we should not fear God's wrath because we are, we are in a relationship with him. Fear, fear, will, fear will make us separate us from the creator because we are scared of him and we feel like he's unapproachable. But, uh, but when we know the truth of God's word, God's love and God's mercy and God's forgiveness for us, then we cannot fear him but have a relationship with him. Uh, number three, God has given us a spirit of a calm and a well-balanced mind. Uh, this is good for me because uh, a lot of people have told me I'm crazy. Uh, <laughs> I believe that myself at times. But Psalm 23, 3 says this, he restores my soul. Um, one of the verses I've, I've come to uh, memorize by heart uh, and sow it, sow it into my spirit is Psalm 23. Um, and, and it says right here in this version, it says, he restores my soul. But love the verse, uh, he refreshes my soul. Yeah. I, I've repeated to myself sometimes over and over, he refreshes my soul. He refreshes my soul. I speak that truth to myself. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. I lack nothing. God's my shepherd. I lack nothing. I, I, another verse says, God is my shepherd. I want nothing. I don't need anything if I have him, right? He refreshes my soul. He guides me in the right path for his name's sake. Even though I walk through a darkest valley, I fear no evil for he is with me. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. He prepares a table for me in the presence of my enemies. My cup 
is, uh, he anoints my head with oil. My cup is overflowed. Surely his goodness and love will pursue me all the days of my life. What do, what, uh, what do I have to fear with that truth, right? For, it says, it says he, he leads me on the path of righteousness, not for me, for his name's sake. Fear does not need to rule my mind. Uh, when we know what God's word says, we should take authority over our mind, our emotions, and our fear. Number four, God has given us a spirit of discipline and self-control. Second Corinthians 10.4 says this, For the weapons of warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Fear does not need to take rule over our life, man. Uh, we have everything it takes to overcome any fear that we're going to face in our life, any weapon that enemy uh, throws at us by having faith in God through his word. In my life, you heard some of it today, I, I've seen so much incredible courage from Aziz, from other Afghans, from our U.S. service members. Uh, I've had friends, uh, Foster Harrington, who I served with for 10 years, laid down his life for people that he never met before. Uh, I've, I've seen incredible sacrifice and incredible courage in my life. I've been very, very privileged to see that firsthand, and uh, especially in combat. But of all the things I've seen, uh, there is no greater standard of courage that I have witnessed in my life than the strength of Jesus Christ on Calvary when he faced crucifixion. Uh, for days, uh, months, even years before crucifixion, his anticipation was building for that very moment. The clock was ticking for Jesus to face his destiny on that cross. And Jesus, he had a very clear mission. Uh, and, and, I mean, he would, Jesus came to earth for a very clear mission. It was to trade his life for ours as a sacrificial lamb for all the sins of the world. That was Jesus' clear mission. That was his directive. And he was intimately aware of the Old Testament. We know this from the Bible, that Jesus was intimately aware of the Old Testament teachings and prophecies concerning the sacrificial death that he would face. Jesus knew exactly what was in store for him. I don't know what point, what age he knew that, but at some point before his ministry started, he knew exactly what he was in store for, right? So Jesus is facing death. And I wonder if that knowledge ever kept him up at night. I wonder if Jesus ever faced the fear or dealt with the anguish that was to come. I don't believe Jesus actually faced fear because fear is the unknown, but even if he didn't face fear of the enemy of Satan, he certainly faced anguish, right? Uh, I had, there's an old recon, Marine recon saying, it says, the anticipation of drowning is worse than drowning itself, right? The anticipation of drowning is worse than drowning itself. Drowning actually isn't that bad. It's a pretty fast death. It's the anticipation of it. The panic, you imagine the panic of about to drown. The definition of panic is the sudden overwhelming terror that destroys a person's capacity for self-help. The sudden overwhelming terror, that terror and anticipation. Jesus had to have dealt with this. His entire life he lived in anticipation, knowing that he would not only face false accusations, uh, arrest, torture, and a brutal murder, but he would face rejection from his own creation. Those whom he loved the most. But despite all of that, despite all of that, he moved forward with his mission. In Matthew 26, we see a glimpse of Jesus in his final moments. And after the Last Supper, his final meal, he went off with some of his disciples to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he told them this, my soul is overwhelmed with a sorrow to the point of death. Jesus walked off, and he prayed for over an hour. The Bible says he was pacing back and forth. He even fell on his face to the ground, and he said this, my father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. He's like, I don't know, I don't know if I could do it. What he said, I don't, know if, I don't know if I could do it. But then he said, yet not as my will, but your will. Not, 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 it's not about me. What do you want me to do? He asked, this, he asked God this three times. Luke's, uh, Luke's actually gives, Luke actually gives a, a visualization of Jesus' extreme anguish in this moment. It says, his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. But after that, after that moment of anguish, we see the courage of Jesus. He returns to his disciples and he says this, the hour has come. And the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Uh, I said it earlier, courage is not the absence of fear, but rather the decision that something else is more important than that fear and then moving forward anyway. Jesus didn't turn himself over because he was weak or he was meek. He turned himself over because he was strong. Uh, he did it for us. Even the bravest of us, like in that moment, would have ran or fought back in last, one last attempt to beat destiny, but Jesus bravely embraced his. And in his final moments, during the intense pain and horror 
of crucifixion, because crucifixion was brutal, Jesus spoke several words. The final and most powerful was his affirmation that his mission was complete when he said, it is finished. But before he said these final words, he said something that could be misunderstood. And I've heard it misunderstood plenty of times. And uh, I study apologetics, Vody Bauckham talked about this. And um, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Uh, I've heard it asked, you know, why, why would Jesus say this? Why would Jesus say, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Did he really believe that God, his father, forsaken him? I believe this. I believe that when Jesus said this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Or Eli, Eli, Lama Sabachthani, was, which is the Aramaic title for Psalm 22. So if you were in that time, I would not have said, turn your Bibles to Psalm 22 because it wasn't written and categorized that way. What I would have said was, turn your Bible to the title, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And so you would have turned that Bible to that. So Jesus wasn't asking God, the Father, uh, why are you why are you forsaking me? What Jesus was doing, he was referring to the prophecy of the crucifixion. It was written a thousand years before Christ was even born by someone who never even witnessed crucifixion before because crucifixion hadn't even been, been invented yet. Yet, the author of Psalm 22 narrated the crucifixion with accuracy a millennium before it occurred. It was divine, and it showed that Jesus was referring to it as a prophecy. And I want to give a, read an excerpt from it in uh, Psalm 22. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? By the way, I want to remind you, this was written 1,000 years before the crucifixion. When, when, uh, when David wrote this, crucifixion had not even been invented yet. I think that's an important point. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You are so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish, but I am a worm and not a man, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They hurl insults, shaking their heads. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him, since he delights in him. Many bulls surround me. Strong bulls of Basham encircle me. Roaring lions, they tear their prey. Open their mouths wide against me. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is turned into wax, and it is melted within me. My mouth is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. And they lay me in the dust of death. Dogs surround me. A pack of villains encircle me. They pierce my hands and my feet, and all my bones are on display. People stare and gloat over me. They divide my clothes among them and cast lots for them. And they cast lots for my garments. And then it it concludes and says this. They will proclaim his righteousness, declaring to a people unborn yet. He has done it. Psalm 22, 31. He has done it. It was finished. The prophecy was fulfilled and Jesus' mission was complete. Why, Why did he do it? Because he wanted to. Because he loves us. Because beyond his fear, beyond his anguish that he dealt with, he had a mission and he moved forward anyway. If Jesus could do that for you, if he could do that for me, then how could we not be inconvenienced enough beyond our fears to do the work that he actually created us to do, right? We can't avoid the things that God burns us to do just because they're scary, just because they're hard, just because they have risks, just because they're dangerous or simply uncomfortable or inconvenient. We must take action in our lives when God burdens us to do things. We must go beyond the fear of the voice of the enemy that tells us, no, that we can't do that, that we're not qualified, that we're going to get hurt, that we're taking a risk. The greatest things in this world that I've witnessed, the greatest things in the world come on the other side of fear. This is, I mean, the Ukraine effort we're doing right now. I remember being in a room and C. Spray said, hey, I'm on the, he, he, I'm watching him, he's on the phone with the Pentagon and I could tell something's up. And he gets off that phone and says, there's a Fox News reporter named Benjamin Hall. He has a wife at home. He's an American. He has a wife at home. He has two little girls. He was, Kiev is under attack. He just got hit with a, with a, with a bomb. Uh, he's in critical condition. They say he has about 48 hours to live. The U.S. military can't go get him. The CIA can't go get him. The only people that can go get him is us. And if we don't go get, go get him, he's going to die. Uh, Kiev was under attack. The Russians were, were taking it. And uh, not one person in that room said no. Everyone was like, let's go get him. And we drove all night, and we went and got Benjamin Hall, and we got him back to his family. We went back the next day to get Pierre and drive his body out safely to have his his, uh, dead body to be delivered to his wife with dignity. Um, Right now, uh, Mighty Oaks uh, Oaks alumni, Mighty Oaks team leaders are in Ukraine right now in in Russian-occupied area. Uh, sharing the gospel and delivering audio Bible sticks 
and, uh, and doing things that are scary, that are dangerous. Uh, but they're doing things that God burden their hearts to do. I want to close with this. I found, uh, I've found my journey to Christianity uh, to be a challenging one. I'm a skeptic by nature. Uh, I don't take things uh, for face value. I'm not the kind of guy that goes into a church and says, I'm going to believe it because he believes that. Uh, I challenge everyone, uh, especially if you're here today and, and you're new to faith and you have your doubts and skepticism like I have, I challenge you to ask the hard questions. You should ask the hard questions. I can assure you it's only going to build your faith. I asked the hard questions. I did this study. I, I, I studied apologetics. I want to know if I'm going to believe this after I surrender my life to Christ, if I'm going to believe this and blindly surrender to Christ, which I believe you could do that, uh, I want to still know why I believe what I believe. What's the difference between this book and the other books? What's the difference between the Christian faith and the other faiths? I wanted to know why. And, and I studied this book. I went for the search and the answers for the answers. And this book makes some incredibly bold claims. It does. But I'm convinced uh, beyond, a certain, beyond every bit of certainty that every one of those bold claims are absolute truth. I've read this thing cover to cover. And, uh, and this book is different than any other book because it's alive. And, uh, and, 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 and through going all through all the scriptures from the beginning and the most powerful verse in this book to me, the mo- and everybody asks what's their favorite verse. And I wouldn't say it's my favorite verse, but to me, it's the most powerful verse. Uh, it's Genesis 1-1, the very first verse of the Bible. In fact, it's the very first 10 words of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. I think that's the most powerful words in the Bible. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So why, why, why would I say that's the most powerful verse? Here's why. Because if you believe that, if you believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that God created all, then you must recognize that if he created all, then he has authority over all. And if God has authority over all, then God is sovereign. And if God is sovereign, then you can trust him. You can trust that he holds it all in the palm of his hands. He holds your personal lives, your safety, your security, your future, all of it on earth and eternal. He holds it all in the palm of his hands. And if you could grasp that and believe that, then you could hold the faith that it gives us the power to overcome any fear that Satan in this world will throw at you. Can we pray? Lord, I thank you that you've created us not just to, not just because, Lord. You created us for a mission and a purpose in each one of us. If we still have a breath in our lungs, we still have that mission and purpose that you created us for. And the enemy of you, the enemy of us, the enemy of the spiritual realm that we, that we battle with daily, Lord, he knows how dangerous we are uh, to him for the kingdom. He speaks fear to us, Lord. He speaks lies to us. Lord, I thank you for your truth through your word, and I pray for each man here that they will have the intentionality to pick up that book, to lock arms with their brothers, to join a church in this community if they're not in it, Lord, to take a step further to really know your word so that they will have a faith that will overstand any fear that the enemy puts before them, Lord. And I pray that these men be men of courage, they be men of intentionality, they be men of purpose, and they will uh, do incredible things through you that only they can do with you, Lord. And I just pray for that in in Jesus' name. Lord, I I, I ask that if you guys kill Steve, your heads bowed, bowed, please. Men, I know that one of the biggest fears that men face because of our own pride and our own egos is the fear of living outside of ourselves and saying we could do it and relinquishing our lives to God. Just, to, just that, that fear of just stepping out from where you are and say, Jesus, I can't do it. Uh, I need you. Uh, my, my life's a wreck and I need you. That is probably one of the biggest things that men fear with, uh, deal with with fear. And it's because of the same thing I mentioned earlier. It's because the enemy is whispering in your ear that you don't need Jesus, that, and he's speaking the, the, to your own ego and your own pride to say that it's, it's stupid, it's embarrassing, uh, and, and you get in your own way by listening to the enemy. And I want to challenge you today, as, a challenge, as I'm challenging you to step out and, and encourage beyond fear, if that's you, that you will make that bold decision today 
to step out of that fear, to deny the lies of the enemy, and step in their relationship with Christ and begin your journey to be exactly the man that God created you to be. And if, if that's you today, then I would like you to raise your hand to me, and, uh, and I want to just pray right where you are. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. That's the courage. That's the courage that we need to see. And man, you can put all your, you guys put your hands down. God bless you. Lord, I just pray for these men that raise their hand, Lord, that they will acknowledge that you can do something for them that they can't do alone, Lord, that you came here to sit on that cross and die for their sins so that they could be the men that you created them to be, Lord. And I pray that they will be connected here in this church or the church that they're, that they're from, Lord, and they will lock arms with brothers and, and move forward courageously in the lives that you created them to live. In Jesus' name, we had some hands raised, so let's give them a clap. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. God bless you guys. Thank you, Pastor Ron. Love you, man.